started working on motorcycles when I was 15 and was absolutely ecstatic to work on them and get paid the princely sum of a dollar and sixty cents an hour. I've always liked mechanical things and, and uh, mechanical intricacies and uh, came across various basket case motorcycles and one until after I bought four or five of them that I realized you could actually go out and buy them in one piece. You know, they, they weren't everywhere in boxes but uh, I've always enjoyed the, the fabrication, the construction, solving the puzzles as opposed to the enjoyment of riding them. I'm not a biker. I never have been. I've been a fabricator, a constructor, but I never really ever considered myself a biker. I have also was much more appreciative of the creative aspect of it and working on the things here rather than just going out and sitting on it and riding it around. The street has never been a, a friendly environment for me and never one that you can go out and go ten tenths. And halfway just don't do it. My name's Nick Moore. I've been working here at Motorcycle Performance for 12 years now. Do pretty much everything. Um, on the bikes I do, on the race bikes I do the suspension, wheels, brakes and uh, chain, stuff like that. Working here has been great. Um, it's nice have not having a one brand that you have to stick to, and it makes it interesting that we get to work on anything from Harleys to the Jap sport bikes, you know, to some of the British bikes. It's, it's great, everybody flows really well, and uh, we do a lot of things to um, get together and hang out some of our uh, different events that we do here at the shop and have a good time. Fred Wiege, uh, Lead Tech is what Bill always calls me. Um, been here for 12 years, longest job I've ever had. <laughs> Guess that's a testament to Bill. Bill is uh, quite the guy to work for. Um, Nick is awesome, WJ, he's a, he does a great job up front. And, um, dealing with the customers and keeping us busy. And it's an amazing learning experience to work in here. I mean, uh, Bill is uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever met, um, not just in, in the field of motorcycle and engineering and mechanics, but uh, in general. The uh, opportunity to, to be creative here is, is what makes me want to come to work every day. You know, it's not the same thing every day. It's never the same thing two days in a row, it seems. There's always something going on. Not always fun, not always productive, but hopefully, you know, if I'm going to make a mistake, it'll be a new one. We went out to uh, Bonneville, and that's something that you go out there and you do because you love it. There's no big money in it but you have people that go out there and do it because they love it. You go out there and the closest thing I can compare Bonneville to is a mechanical burning man. You go out there and you see a chopped 32 Ford coupe with a nitro injected Hemi in it and it's got salt up and down the sides of this thing. That's something you're doing because you love it. You know, it, it's something that there's no money in it. There's personal satisfaction, you know, once again can't resist a challenge. Every time you go out there, it's a test of yourself and the motorcycle.
parents wouldn't let me have a street bike, what's the next logical alter alternative? You know, you know, they said, well, you know, you can't have a street bike till you're 18. I went on go motocross racing. And bought an old ratty bike and beat on it a little while and went out and raced it. Had a good time and just took it from there and I gravitated towards flat track and ice racing. After the flat tracking sort of migrated, I've, I've always liked drag racing. I mean even as a kid I built models of funny cars. That was about the same time that we started business here and had a chance to uh, broaden horizons a little bit. Once you got done trying to earn a living, then you went back in the back at night and did what you wanted to do for fun. Won our first national title, and at that point we were running turbocharged gasoline, and the bike ran 860s pretty consistently at 165 to 170 miles an hour. We got into the blown fuel deal in uh, 1982, uh, about mid-season, and met with uh, reasonably good success with that. So we were the, at the end of the season, we'd won the top fuel title by one round and had been the 10th bike in the world in the sevens. Unfortunately, the seven second club had eight members. <laughs> so were the, the famous almost never was. You know, you win the national title and, and run your first seven second lap um, really is a huge, huge plus. I mean, it's hard to, to get that kind of high on a regular basis later on. I got sidetracked with other programs and, and situations and the money that took to run it. I could tell I was trading on my wife's incredible sense of humor after about 1984 because at that point I tried to commit financial suicide two years running and hadn't been successful yet but I was drawing a bead in on that that target that would put me out of business permanently and luckily I guess luckily the wheels did fall off the cart because it was just something that no matter how much I loved it I realized that if I wasn't around didn't have the business around I wouldn't have an opportunity to do it again. Uh, we've been doing some uh, road racing in 1982 and 83 with uh, Mike Treadaway and uh, had been successful there, had some regional titles with him. And we still had our hands in the road racing. Ed Key is somebody who I've known for many, many years. It's neat when you do some work for somebody and they take it out and they do such a good job with it. You know, it it's really, it's what you live for. And Ed's won, if I'm not mistaken, either 12 or 13 national titles with those bikes. And I, I take a lot of pride in that, you know, that, that I know somebody that's capable of doing, uh, doing that well. And drag racing, like I said, has always been a, a big deal for me uh, because it's chassis and motor. I'm not a good rider and uh, not particularly brave, so it's always fun to, to see if you can scare the hell out of the guy that's on it. I've been coming to Bonneville for about uh, seven years now. I grew up riding motorcycles and I raced motocross for a lot of years. Um, I did okay with motocross actually and I road raced for a little bit. I was uh, diagnosed with MS now about 17 years ago and I was looking for a way to promote awareness about the illness because everybody's familiar with the illness but nobody, unless they live with somebody or somebody close to them has it, understands really the illness. I started uh, road racing old vintage bikes and then got into more modern bikes. We were racing uh, the National Endurance Series which we did pretty well on. and. Uh, my symptoms kept getting worse and worse to where I was going to be a danger to myself and other people on the track. So I was trying to figure out some way to stay active and do things. And I uh, thought Bonneville, a straight line, who can I hurt? So that's how I ended up here. Bill, I met through Fred. Actually, I knew Fred before. Uh, I started this thought process and Bill, very unwisely, instead of saying, get the hell out of my shop, Said, yeah, I think I can. I can think I can help you with this one. So, and it's uh, an amazing effort, and the, the amount of time and effort that's gone into it. And they know how to treat me. They give me a project. They know I won't mess up too bad. Let me work on it for a day, and they work on the things that matter. And it's worked out well that way. <laughs> I've always loved old Triumphs. We decided to do this. I was uh, running my old bike, and even though my bike was bone stock, which needed to be for the class, 
we had used aluminum aftermarket Triumph barrels because we had to press new sleeves in to get the bore correct so that we could compete in the class. But it was protested, so it didn't count. So then we decided, uh, well, no, we're coming back with something different. And we generated this bike to come back with. It's, it's kind of unique in the fact that uh, the head's backwards. Uh, so we had to run it backwards for the blower. We have a small blower on there off a car. Um, it's really not that heavily modified. Uh, bore and stroke are pretty consistent. Bill from Motorcycle Performance built the frame. Uh, Morgan Broadhead, a good friend of mine who raced for us when we were road racing, uh, supplied a front fork and wheel for us. And it's been a, it's, it's really been a team effort. Uh, Fred and Nick from Motorcycle Performance built the motor and got it running and tuning and it's uh, it's kind of like being with MS, you know, you, it takes a group to get through the day and it's been a group here. I'm Lou Terpstra and uh, I've always been interested in cars and motorcycles and motorcycles in particular. I found out uh, that uh, Bill Wisnott was uh, going to Bonneville and they were going to uh, try for some speed records. I'd never been there, I've always thought about it, but then I thought, you know, why not? I'm retired now and I'll go take a look. I thought, you know, there's a class for everybody. You know, maybe I could do this. I bought a 1971 Triumph Bonneville. Came up with this scummy, scuzzy uh, Triumph Bonneville. Uh, engine was seized and uh, I thought, perfect. 650 production push rod. Uh, the motorcycle must appear in all respects to be as it came from the factory. Absolutely stock, right down to uh, the type of shift lever you have on it and everything else. The displacement must be 650 cc or uh, less. The, the bike itself uh, has a higher compression than normal. Uh, it has a different camshaft. Uh, the head internally has been uh, has been worked on and flowed so that it flows more freely. Bigger valves. I did not uh, do any of the build. Bill and uh, Nick Moore and Fred here at uh, Motorcycle Performance did everything. My uh, involvement was to uh, disassemble the bike completely. Uh, find a lot of parts, uh, clean everything up, which was with this bike uh, quite a major issue. Uh, and I just gave it to Bill and say, here, build it, and he did. That's one reason I bought a Triumph. You can find high performance parts for these old motorcycles without too much trouble. There are companies that still make high performance part, parts for these bikes. I first considered a, an old Norton uh, 650 uh, SS, which in, in the day of 71, they were faster than the Triumphs. However, A, you can hardly ever find a Norton 650 SS. B, they're horrendously expensive when you do and see there are no parts. So, you know, Triumph seemed like the way to go. The uh, construction of the Triumph was coincidental with the uh, phase two of the Long Ducati, uh, we sort of look at it as, you know, describe this bike now as the freight train because it's so long. The, the time between 2000, October 2007, and when we ran it again in October of 2009, uh, with an eye towards making sure we had enough horsepower and being able to uh, finish what we were hoping to accomplish as far as licensing and stability testing. The uh, C license after the 2007 uh, trip helped uh, 
help fill in some of the gaps as far as not setting the world on fire. Having raced for almost 40 years, you don't over estimate what you can accomplish or you're just going to let yourself in for a lot of discouragement and your friends are going to rib the hell out of you if you screw up and come back with your tail between your legs. The 2009 trip uh, involved the uh, ability to try to get the, the bike to run closer to 200 and once again further stability testing. One of the big dichotomies of, of running at Bonneville it, for the SCTA is you cannot operate the racing vehicle except on the course. The bike or the car has to be towed everywhere. The big dichotomy is that you cannot do it, you cannot be there without help from friends, crew, spouse, whoever. There has to be people involved helping you. But when you pull up on the starting line and you're staring down five miles of salt, you are all alone. So we had in 2009, our second day, the bike wasn't running real well and I thought, well, it'll clear out, it'll be okay. And I just rolled into it a little bit more and then all of a sudden it sounded like somebody set a bomb off underneath me. Uh, the intake manifold, uh, there was a backfire and it exploded. And since we have a draw through system that was full of gas and air, pressurized at 30 mile pounds of pressure. So it was a rather spectacular explosion. We managed to find somebody to stitch it together and then we went to the the uh, local hardware store and bought some epoxy and some sandpaper and finished the job in the motel room that night and put it on top of the heater and uh, to make sure it was fully cured and went back the next day. Made a couple more runs. The bike was starting to feel good but it just wasn't right. We got the C license. The next one was the B which was 175 to 199 and we went through on the last day on Saturday and the bike was running good it was about 190 miles an hour that um, it starts to shake a little bit and feel a little spooky and I just kept on it and roll it up a little tighter and went through and went okay that should be enough for the license I'm going through and going damn now what I rolled off the throttle hell with it. I want a good time plaque out of this. I want to make the boys proud. Got back in it. Started to vibrate worse than it ever had and I couldn't see out the windscreen. And just about the time the thing started to really shake there was a huge explosion on the underneath me and I'd managed to set off the manifold again. Instead of running poorly it just quit. Pulled off and I was greeted by a SCTA officials truck and driving up and looking, looking at me and watching me and I put my feet down and got it stopped and he came up and I quick put my helmet over the intake manifold so we didn't see that and uh, he asked if I was okay and I said yeah yeah I'm, I'm good he says yeah that was pretty loud we heard that in the timing tower three miles away but the licensing quarter mile time was 195 you know, which was I thought pretty good there's a million Harleys out there on the salt smart money would be a four-cylinder Japanese bike and this particular 999-749 Tesla Strata series motor is shown at 302 horsepower on the dyno with no breakage. I mean, that is an impressive uh, pedigree. That gentleman is the most powerful Ducati in the world. Period. It's such a surreal environment. There's really nothing here. I mean, it's just this big, open, flat area, and it's, I mean, it's it's truly 
unlike anywhere else. You feel like you're on the moon, and you think, this is one of the strangest places I've ever seen. You get off I-80, and you go about a mile and a half on a, a, a blacktop road, and you get to the end of blacktop road, it just ends, and there's nothing there. I said, well, where are the races to the guy who was there taking tickets? He says, well, you go about four miles that way. And I said, I don't see anything. He said, well, just go straight. He says, you'll see something. You know, so you get out there and you're on the salt. You just keep going straight. Don't turn the wheel because you might miss it. And pretty soon you start seeing, you know, trucks and trailers and cars on the salt like this. And, well, this must be the place you drive up. And there they are. Everybody's just kind of spread out there in the salt working on the cars and motorcycles. Out of Bonneville, almost everything's a story because it's all handmade. And there's such a history here. They've been operating here now over 50 years. And there's been so much history set here that it's, uh, it's really just a thrill to get out here and run, whether you get a record or not. It, the thrill is just being at Bonneville and running at Bonneville. It's weird knowing that there's 11 plus miles of completely flat. And it's, it's almost peaceful to look around and uh, to be able to go down the salt at speed is an experience I was lucky to have and lucky to keep having. To be able to sit on the line and look down the salt has been really great. A 16 and a half or 17 second mile seems like forever because you're leading up to it, you're listening for every little thing, you're trying to get as small as you can behind the bubble, and you're just listening and listening and listening and watching the markers go by and they're going by pretty damn fast they're every quarter mile so you see a new marker every four seconds qualifying you have to beat the record um, once you beat it you have four hours to get, you have one hour to get back to tech once you're in tech you have four hours to work on the bike and the, the officials are watching you the whole time and uh, you're the first ones out in the salt the next morning for the return runs for the records. They uh, average the two runs together and you have to, I believe it's 2%, you have to beat the old record by. You mentioned Bonneville to a, a motorsports fan around the world, they immediately know where it is. And once you go to Bonneville, once you've been on the salt and you look around, when you see a commercial on TV, you can immediately that was filmed at Bonneville. The people who go to Bonneville to both watch and particularly uh, to participate are uh, different from a lot of other race types. There's virtually no ego involved in both of these guys. These are technicians. These are people who are, are either real engineers or self-taught engineers and fabricators who want to see what, how, what they made, how well it can do. It is uh, unbelievably, excuse me, somebody just went by real fast, I had to look. This is racing for racing's sake. I'd been there twice before I went with Bill, once when I was probably two and a half or three years old. But then they helped a friend move a number of years ago. We stopped at the, at the rest spot in the, in the salt and just looked at it. And, uh, I always knew that Sunday I'd have to get back there and, and do it. It's a different feel that you get in the pits. Here everybody tries to help everybody. Everybody's trying to see you succeed and uh, kind of looking out for each other and it's just a, it's a little community actually out here, which makes it a lot more fun to be out here. So I decided just to build the bike. Who built the starter? The starter me. cracks me up. My yeah. God, that's that hysterical. My... Well, I built that like several years ago. because I was stroke starting a two-stroke. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and we started it with that chainsaw because it, you wouldn't dare kick it over. It'd break your leg. Yeah. You know, if it went off before. You're not getting before any the... younger. <laughs> no, I didn't even want to try it. My mechanic said, we're taking the starter off the tranny right now. And so I built that chainsaw. That, that, is, that is cool. But the people that are involved with it are the essential part. They are what make it what it is. The officials, the timing, you know, timing and scoring, the people that help you at home. You know, I could never even think about going out there. Wouldn't even bother to put a key in the truck to go if I didn't have the help here at home. And Bonneville really revitalized my outlook on things because I realized that, yeah, you can be creative and you don't have to be in front of uh, millions of people and have you know, 
a million dollar sponsorship package to enjoy what you're doing and be successful at it. I'm a drag racer at heart, always have been, always will be. What we needed to do was have a platform to allow us a more portable testing uh, location for uh, the land speed stuff. This bike here takes an hour to an hour and a half to set the dyno up. It takes two people minimum to move it, to set it up, tie it down. You've got an hour and a half every time you want to make a test. The drag bike fits on the dyno, just running the carriage all the way forward. It's, it's a bit of a hybrid, but it, its original intent and the one that justifies this, its existence is the ability to roll it on without the attending huge amount of screwing around that is required to run the, the freight train on the dyno. And I decided, well, let's see if we can keep things as simple and as elemental as they can be. We'll use the fixed timing ignition we ran at, at Bonneville last year. We'll run a carbureted system, which has blown up on us in the past. You don't gag the throttle, gag it and go, or it spins the tire and you just waste the whole, you know, waste the run. We can make this work at the drag strip because you're, you do gag it. You are all the way open. You push the air shifter and you simply keep the throttle full out, full open for the duration of the pass. Shut the throttle and you're done. So you basically, it, it either idles happily or it's wide open. It did provide a, a platform to test, and you know the freight train is really a pain in the butt to ride around the block. The drag bike is actually pretty fun. You know, once it gets rolling and uh, it takes off, and it it accelerates pretty hard.
last year we were rained out here for world finals really rained out this was a lake you could have water skied on it um, the year before and the year before that we got a record both years first one and it's been a, anytime you run in Bonneville it's a learning process especially with something like this where nobody's doing this there's not like you can find records and you go oh that's what we want to do there nobody has those records um, so the first year we ran and the record we created wasn't as high as anybody wanted but it was a record it's like okay do we take the record or do we try to you know go again and maybe blow the motor and not have anything but like, take the record so the next year we came back and uh, I ran the first run and I uh, had a family emergency and had to uh, run back to Madison and Nick uh, rode the second half for us and we ended up uh, up in the number it, it was it was great it was amazing scary at first never been out there and don't know what the feeling is like with the traction and everything else we did a record run the carburetor fell off so we couldn't back it up then did another record run then the main fuse blew then made another record run and went to back it up and finally the last day we were i believe like two or three last on the salt and we ended up finally getting the record on that which was uh, 132 miles an hour and we now have uh, two land speed records with it not one this year however we had a few bugs this year it's been a long week chasing gremlins around the bike but um, that's part of racing you know there's good days and bad days well the goal with the with the, the freight train was to be the world's fastest Ducati a gentleman named Wayne Patterson in Australia has been uh, you know we've been sort of cheering each other on he's got uh, what I've found to be the world's quickest Ducati and to be able to say you've got the quickest and hopefully the fastest Ducati that's that's one of the goals it was an emotional time when I first saw um, our bikes run um, and I even got caught up in so, so much that we we're supposed to jump in the truck to go chase them down and I was just standing there with my jaw hanging open you know thinking this is something I'm, I'm gonna be doing for the rest of my life and I think you know. it's it's a pretty cool feeling you know watching bikes that you've had a hand in go down the salt um, and, uh, I'm definitely hooked that's <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a bucket list sort of thing. Uh, I'm 69. I'll be closing in on 70 when I go to Bonneville. And uh, I really want to do this at my age. I want to just, you know, at least attempt to set a record. And uh, uh, I kind of scratch that off my list and say, all right, I did that. The current record is about 101.5 miles an hour. Uh, all I need to do is go faster than that twice and uh, I'll set the record. That doesn't sound like a lot. How, however, these Triumph Bonnevilles couldn't go 100 in their best day when they were new. You know, 95 was about it with these things. At Bonneville is at 4,700 feet, uh, which considerably compromises power on these bikes and it's on salt, which is quite a bit different from being on, on, on pavement. Uh, Altogether, you're probably going to be losing 15% at least uh, on, on uh, performance potential on these bikes. 2010, went to 0509, and that was a, I felt that was a, a reasonable conclusion to the week's events. It's bragging rights too, you know, I got an A license. There's not that many A licenses given at Bonneville. We went back. Uh, finished tearing down the Triumph, certify the world record that we'd set on that, and loaded everything up and came home. To be able to set a world record and be the first Ducati over 200 at Bonneville uh, puts us in the history books in both columns. I'd like to see somewhere between 221 and 231 out of the bike on the salt. I think that can be done. The speed record in the class is 252 miles an hour. If we can, get, like I said, if we can run we can get a 221 to 231, somewhere in that vicinity will be good. The people that, that are instrumental in that kind of an effort, you know, with people like Nick Moore and Fred Wiege, Bill Shields, my family, Bob Crook, Louis Lamore, those are the guys that go out there and lump for us. I mean, they're, they provide the comic relief and the fetch and catch driving and load the bikes up because when you're done with a run on the freight train, 
you're pretty much tired. And my all my daughters, my middle daughter actually does the paint and the body work on the land speed bikes. You know, to, to be a father who says, yeah, my daughter painted that stuff. To do that creates an immeasurable level of pride. You know, the fact that my oldest daughter does the website and the blogs and helps keep up on that. The youngest daughter uh, works, you know, cleans machines and helps us work on the pit bikes and cleans the truck and the trailer. And while that's not technically complicated, those are still important jobs. To feel that level of pride is something you cannot do if you've alienated your family by blindly thrashing trying to accomplish a goal that in itself is pretty noticeable, but at the expense of your family? Absolutely not. Or your friends? And I'm not easy to get along with as a rule. You know, I'm what people would commonly call driven, motivated, an ass. You know, it's, it, it's described in any one number of formats, but it is something that I do appreciate when people help me like that, and I try to express that appreciation. You know, the support that my family has given me has also come to the fore with recent uh, developments for me personally with my health in that um, in January of 2011 I was diagnosed with stage 4 prostate cancer. That is a devastating diagnosis in and of itself and without the help of these people would be debilitating. It would basically for what I would see, uh, destroy what would be left of my life. Lou's project was probably one of the most difficult ones because I undertook it with no small amount of uh, reservation because of the amount of work and thrashing and effort that was required to build, to work with Jim on his first Triumph street bike and then the blown triumph. It was a commitment we'd made to Lou, a promise I'd made to him that we would do this. So it was important to me to try to find the wherewithal to complete the project. And it was a considerable struggle. Um, you know, the surrounding issues you have with a cancer diagnosis, the beginning of treatments for that, the side effects of the treatments, the difference in uh, your lifestyle that's required for survival. You really have all the rules have changed and nobody told you what they were going to be and they haven't told you all the changes that were still going to happen. And we, you know, I, can, I hearken back to being able to rely on my family um, for the support in this. This particular type of cancer is not curable and it's something that I'm not a surgery or radiation candidate at this point in history so the uh, only option is to soldier on so to speak. I would consider it a waste if people didn't gain some benefit from the knowledge that uh, that we have of this and to make it a, a point to ask about a person to getting a PSA test and to monitor that it's the second most common male cancer after skin cancer and um, while very few people die from it, most men die with it. It colors my attitude towards things and one of the things that I always said before was that life's too short. Well I tell you what, that takes on a whole new meaning at this point in history. This is 
the first and the only one that I've ever heard of as far as being a nitro clinic to try to demystify the running of nitro, how it's tuned basically, and let me run the bike a couple times. That's Bill's first love, I think, of uh, mechanics is, is uh, nitromethane, um, drag strip action is uh he always says that his attention span suits a uh, quarter mile <laughs> we ran our first pro race at uh, east st louis and i remember on saturday morning we had a chance to uh go up to the starting line i heard this rumbling start up across the parking lot and I, what the heck is that so i lean over the bike and tap the throttle and the concussion on that about knocked me off the cart. That was the first nitro bike I'd actually heard in person. And I went, you know, I sort of like that. We're running um, between 80 and 90 percent nitromethane through that. And we don't know how much that makes because you can't keep it in the dyno long enough because it uh, fuel start making your eyes water and can't breathe. So tried it once and didn't work out well. It's a little bit different animal. It's, it's, uh... The 749 motor we're asking a little bit more of uh, with burning nitro. Um, it's got a different set of, of uh, variables that it throws into the mix like uh, the nitromethane and the, the methanol in the nitromethane mix dilutes the oil so you have changing oil continuously when the engine is running so you go from a really thick uh, nitro 70 weight oil to this stuff that is quite runny and nasty <laughs> when it's all done. Problem is with nitro nowadays, it's only the big people can run it, you know, with the, the big pocketbooks and sponsors and everything. And he was looking for something you could put out as a, almost as an entry level nitro bike. He likes the way that people used to run top fuel in, in, the, in the early days of the sport. You'd come up in a pickup truck, um, two or three guys, and make runs and do what needed to be done, and you didn't have you know, multi-million dollar rigs and teams with tons of spare motors sitting ready to go. Um, and uh, the fact that you could do it and not have to completely bankrupt yourself in the process um, is sort of the idea behind the nitro bike. I don't know what I like. go across the salt on on nitro is songs for the year
better. Um, you know, huh, I don't like this. What the hell am I doing out here? And then all of a sudden it settled down and went, cool. Look like that. Uh, yeah. Somehow we must have put them in just to testing and <laughs> yeah. Oops. Put the wrong plugs in. Yeah. It's just got street, it's plugs. street bike plugs. It's still running perfect. Qualifying record run. All right. But I think the motor's hurt. Oh no. So we might be replacing pistons or a motor yet. Can you do that? If 172 on a 167. Wow. So will they let you do that if you like before the? We have, oh. Yeah, we have four hours. We have one hour to get impound and four hours to do whatever work we need to. to oh wow. The bike. Oh, did somebody pull the plug wire off this? Nope. No. No. I'm not over it yet. Don't, don't start yet. You might as well give it that last Give me another time. hour. <laughs> what we have to do by. 5.30 we hey, ran the run, right? Hey, Bill. It goes directly to the All right, put it in the truck. Let's go. All right. No, oh, you're already done. You know, you got to go re-qualify it. You got eight minutes. Give me one for the zero run to it. Just from the, otherwise they're straight. We'll talk to the guy and see if that's the fact. Set a record, that's different. Go right in the impound from here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Don't ask him. Right. I don't see an FCTA. You have an hour to get the inbound. Well, you don't you go directly to the inbound. You don't stop off with your hits. He's probably right. We'll just verify it. I didn't get an hour Well, I didn't get an hour to get an hour to get the inbound. The problem we run into is we wouldn't be able to change the front front cylinder time anyway by the time they boot inside. In four hours. They aren't going to let us stay here for us. I know, right. 7 o'clock they kick in the cell. We are going to have a front cylinder on this thing, I don't know. Just like a smart ass. We have a one-hour one window, but he wants it there as soon as possible. All right, let's run. Put it, it back in the truck. We can go there. I'll let put it here now. All right, we're good. Uh, yeah. You shouldn't have a dog in this fight. It doesn't matter. It's a big deal. Get in the way. Here's the deal. You qualify and then you take this and you take it to us and we sign it in impound. And you come right here and you unload and then you you have four hours to work from here. Now, if you weren't um, noted by uh, people that were uh, direct competitors against you and they're already bringing it up and mentioning it and if you just parked it there and out of innocence in all honesty I would probably say you know get over here get it done the fact that it's we took the spark plugs out the fact just, that you worked on it at yeah. all and then that somebody's already bringing it up then all right minor problem yes and then okay okay so now can't re-qualify you can't re-qualify today and, and that's it you're just going to have to fix it and do qualify the, tomorrow. Qualify tomorrow. Use this as a learning experience. Okay. However, here is where you need to be. I Immediately, the, the, like with after some, a record run, you better get your ass back here. Why do they say an hour? Sometimes the it, of that is sometimes right it physically here. takes an hour to get back. Here. We got a whiner that's got a problem. I guess there's nothing we that, can that, do that, about it. Well, but see, the way you need to look at it is not. That you got it. You that's, got somebody a whiner. It's just there are certain rules. We do. No, there are certain rules that need rules. to be followed. Yeah. And it's as far as like that's, doing anything, even on the way back in the trailer, working on anything is a no go. All right. And I understand. Oh, it's just a spark plug change. But how do I? How do we know that it's not? Oh, a nitrous bottle oh, removal yeah. or anything. As far as I'm concerned, anybody in that box. Coming back. coming back is you're making yourself suspect. All right. So don't do it, especially if you're. Man, got to go yeah, that's fine. Thank you. We'll take care of it. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to say this, but no. You're, 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 rules are rules. You're, you're, you're to oh, fix it. <laughs> no, we're, we're one step further. Found yeah, the combination. Okay. Thank no, you. no. Let's go. See you later. Okay, guys.
call it again, please? Engine. Came and through there too at 164, 468, 164.468. Well, it's on the turnout road here, just uh, before the three, going about uh, 20 miles an hour. Hey guys. Hey. Ah, it's a motor change this time. No, it's a motor change. Oh boy. Hell, like Best way to make go. a record you can find it, Yeah. Absolutely far and away. Non paired, yeah. Non paired with nitromethane. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
something that I guess everybody dreams of and all I can say is don't wait till it's too late to do it. Get your ass out there and get on the salt. Mm -hmm. 